hitting six first half three pointers to keep Oklahoma in it. Second half, though, the pace slowed down a bit, and that favored Kansas. Watch the great move by Danny Manning. 31 points, 18 rebounds for the All-American. This was the best moment of the game, though. Former NBA great Rick Barry, nervous as he can be as his son has to sink a crucial free throw. Scooter did it, and Rick says, yeah, I knew he could do it, a chip off the old block. But the clinching free throws came from who else? Danny Manning with his dad, the assistant coach, looking nervously on. He sinks them both. And all that was left to do after that was celebrate. The Jayhawks, maybe not the best team all season, but certainly they were last night. They win the NCAA title 83 to 79. All right, coming up at six, highlights of the season opener for the world champion Minnesota Twins. We'll tell you about the latest foiled attempt to trade Yankee slugger Dave Winfield and, yes, believe it or not, the Washington Redskins schedule is out. I'll have a little bit on that, too. Guess who the first game is against? Monday Dallas. night. Dallas. The New York Giants. Aha. Uh -huh. mm. It's not fair. Good game. <laughs> Good game. Yeah, it is. It's going to be great. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Coming up next, uh, the appointment of a judge to teach at a local university is stirring up a controversy. We'll have that story. And although just one was chosen, all of the participants are winners. We'll explain why in just a moment. Stay with us. Open the... Judge Douglas Ginsburg's appointment to the faculty of George Mason Law School is drawing some fire tonight. Ginsburg took the job last week, and today, State Delegate Mary Marshall of Arlington says she's appalled that the law school dean doesn't think Ginsburg, Ginsburg's marijuana use has anything to do with his teaching qualifications. Ginsburg withdrew himself from a Supreme Court nomination last fall after admitting he used marijuana in the, uh, he used marijuana in the 1960s and 70s. In the three years since Project Literacy U.S., or the PLUS program, was launched, more than a half million adults who were unable to read have enrolled in literacy programs. But the outreach program, sponsored by ABC and the Public Broadcasting Service, has yet to reach an estimated 22 million other illiterate adults. Today, promoters of Project Literacy announced they are expanding the program with new initiatives directed at young people. It is not a matter of choosing to concentrate on remedial learning for adults as against helping young people improve their basic skills. We clearly must do both. And that is why, in the extension of PLUS, we will continue our concern for adult illiteracy at the same time that we broaden our focus to youth. Duffy says ABC and PBS stations will be carrying several special broadcasts emphasizing the importance of strong reading skills for young people. Research shows children whose parents uh, are poor readers often never master the basics well enough to escape the cycle of poverty. And you can't get very far if you can't read. There is another reading program which is called RIP, and it has nurtured a lifelong love of reading in millions of youngsters all across this country. It began in 1966. The Reading is Fundamental program encourages kids to spend five hours per week reading or being read to just for the fun of it. Well, today in Northwest D.C., the name of the National Riff Reader was drawn from among a half a million entries in this year's program. The winner was a young girl from Pittsburgh, but Vice President George Bush's wife, Barbara, told the children that they are all winners because they are all readers. There are more than 10,000 Riff programs across the country. And still to come, another special 6888 report as we continue to remember Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Tonight, you're going to hear how it was a double tragedy for one Northeast Washington woman. When I for many of us, remembering Dr. Martin Luther King's legacy brings back quite a few emotions. Well, tonight, in a special look back at 6888, Ed Turney found that it is especially true for a Northwest woman. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. It was part of his genius to show the nation the evils of segregation to show it is so vile a contradiction of our sacred principles that men and women and children who tried to seek the American dream were brutally treated by authorities sworn to protect the dream. The Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity and finds himself in exile in his own land. 
In a handful of years, his leadership led to landmark civil rights laws, court decisions that struck down segregated facilities, guaranteed the right to vote. But Dr. King knew it was meaningless if the poor had no jobs, couldn't afford the blessings of liberty. It meant whites sharing with blacks, new jobs, just as the military brass was calling for another $12 billion to wage an already unpopular war. So he demanded jobs for the poor, an end to the war. For those who say to me, stick to civil rights, I have another answer. That is that I fought too long and too hard now against segregated public accommodation to end up segregating my moral concerns. Now, 20 years later, how close have we come to his dream? Some things would obviously please him. The number of black mayors has risen from six in 1965 to nearly 400 today. The number of black elected officials generally has risen from 600 to over 6,000. And here, a city that seems forever a building. Jobs for the builders, towering new office buildings, homes and schools for all. A municipal center on the site where riots began 20 years ago. An important story. You'll see, see more of that. Not Ed Turney's story, however. We'll have that for you tomorrow on News 7 at 5. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back tomorrow. But right now we have more news on News 7 at 6 with Kathleen Matthews and Paul Berry. Good night. An Annandale man is convicted in Barcelona of drug trafficking. I'm Gail Pennybacher. I'll have the story of Conan Owen coming up. This is Meredith Fuel in Silver Spring, where police are on the lookout tonight for a man who abducted and raped a seven-year-old girl from this playground. I'll have that story coming up. I have a dream. Twenty years later, how close to the dream? And Jesse Jackson, heir to the dreamer or an echo? I'm Jim Clark. I'll have the story. From WJLA-TV, Washington, D.C., the news continues. From the nation's capital, this is News 7 at 6. Good evening, everyone. Re uh, Renee and Wes are off tonight. I'm Paul Berry, along with Kathleen Matthews. A Spanish court today found a young Annandale man guilty of drug smuggling. But the struggle for Conan Owens' freedom is far from over. Justice Department officials say they're convinced of Owens' innocence and are looking for ways to help him. Gail Pennybacker reports on the long ordeal for a Virginia family. It was the most unlucky of days, Friday the 13th, March 1987. 23-year-old Conan Owen of Annandale was arrested and placed in this Barcelona prison, charged with trying to smuggle $200,000 worth of cocaine into Spain. The honors graduate from Syracuse was on a freelance photography assignment, or so he thought. Authorities had found the cocaine in a suitcase. The man who provided Conan with the suitcase and the drugs confessed to doing so. Justice Department officials, including the Attorney General, went to Spain to plead Conan's case. All the while, Conan was detained in Modelo Prison. Two weeks ago, his parents left Washington for Barcelona, where Conan went on trial March 26th. The verdict came today. A three-judge panel found Conan guilty of drug trafficking. U.S. Attorney Henry Hudson says critical evidence on Conan's behalf was not allowed by the Spanish court. One of my assistants, Justin Williams, would have been prepared to testify about the organization which ensnared uh, Conan Owen. We have a substantial amount of evidence that they have on prior occasions uh, solicited people under the same unwitting circumstances to transport drugs, and the court was not interested in hearing that. Disbelief rocked the quiet Annandale neighborhood where the Owens make their home. Next door neighbor Ann Pinto says the community must continue to be strong for the family. We've been watching these last 10 days and just waiting to hear. I, I just, I thought they'd be home, the whole family together, uh, just any day now. Uh, I really didn't think it was going to turn out this way. And I hope they do appeal, and I hope something good turns out. Gail Pennybacher, News 7, Annandale. Earlier in the day, Owen's father spoke with News 7 by telephone from Spain. He said he was devastated by the outcome of the trial. The Spanish court says the time that Owen has already served will be subtracted from his sentence of six years and one day. Well, tonight the hijackers who forced a Kuwaiti jet to land in Iran are demanding the release of 17 pro-Iranian terrorists imprisoned in Kuwait. The Kuwaiti 747 was en route from Thailand to Kuwait when it was seized by Arabic-speaking gunmen 
Three members of the Kuwaiti royal family are among the 112 people aboard. The hijackers released a Jordanian man who had become ill. One man still being held is believed to be an Egyptian American. Montgomery County police are on the lookout for a man in connection with the rape and abduction of a seven-year-old girl. As Meredith Buell reports, the incident has parents in the Silver Spring neighborhood very concerned tonight. Mothers are keeping close tabs on their children tonight in the Forest Park apartments on the Montgomery Prince George's County line. For yesterday morning, a young girl was grabbed from a swing, hurled over a fence and down an embankment, dragged 300 yards and raped. Her hair was matted. She had leaves all over the place. She was dirty from head to toe. Kimberly Green lives next door to the victim. Well, I'm just seeing a child unsupervised is easy prey. Especially when that young? Especially when they're that young. They can't fight back. Police and neighbors say the seven-year-old rape victim and her two-year-old sister were unsupervised and were the only children in the playground at the time of the incident. So often the children are out and nobody knows where they are. And that's the frightening part to me, that they can be there by themselves because I don't think any place is safe. This apartment complex is packed with children and parents we talked to were critical of the victim's mother for apparently allowing her kids to go outside unsupervised. News 7 could not reach the mother, who is even being criticized by police for allegedly failing to notify them of the incident right away. I'm afraid to say that in this, in this instance, uh, we were not notified right away. And uh, even though we had witnesses to the, uh, the abduction, and there were people who heard screams and so forth, but the police were not called, so uh, that disturbs me. Shock. Shock. Very upset that this could happen. Susan Smith is the apartment manager. Today she sent a letter to all residents about a meeting with police Thursday night. Just everybody getting involved, maybe having a parent watch, parents coming out to the playground, um, keeping an eye on the kids. Residents say there was a drug-related murder at this complex last year, but efforts to start a neighborhood watch program failed. However, the neighbors told us today they now plan to band together to watch out for each other and each other's children. Meredith Fuel, News 7, in Silver Spring. Police do have a description of the suspect. They're looking for a white man in his 20s with long black hair, a gold earring, and a T-shirt with a skull and crossbones. If you have any information, call Montgomery County Police. Well, a 17-year-old youth is under arrest tonight for a weekend of murder outside a Northeast D.C. go-go club. He's Lafayette Gunting Dotson of Hyattsville. Dotson is charged with first-degree murder and the shooting death of Keith Bennett early Sunday morning. Bennett was trying to rescue a pregnant woman who was being beaten outside the Metro Club on Bladensburg Road. Witnesses say Dotson shot Bennett several times, including a final fatal shot in the head. Tonight, the owner of a rooming house where a fire killed three children last week has been fined $15,000 for housing violations. City investigators say Russell Hughes did not have the proper licenses for as many as 10 rooming houses, including this one in Northeast where the fatal fire occurred. Hughes was also fined for health and safety violations in all 10 houses. He refused to comment on the specific charges. City officials have already closed one of Hughes's properties and they're promising further action if properties. necessary. Some of them may be short-term violations. Uh, we are now in the process of looking and reviewing. We just did the inspection on Saturday. We're in the process now of reviewing that information, and as soon as that determination is made, for those that are life and health threatening, we will close just as we did this one. For those that are not, we will make a review and make a determination based on the violations that were found. Most residents of the house destroyed by fire and the one closed by the city have been relocated to emergency shelters. Well, how far have we come since the days of Dr. Martin Luther King? Coming up, we'll continue our look at civil rights successes and failures since the late 60s. And we'll look at a tight race for Democratic delegates in the Wisconsin primary today. Twenty years ago today, parts of the district were burning as rioters took to the streets in the wake of Martin Luther King's murder. King's life and death transformed our civil rights history. Tonight, Jim Clark continues his look at how, at how much has and has not changed since the violent 60s. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. 
It was part of his genius to show the nation the evils of segregation, to show it is so vile a contradiction of our sacred principles that men and women and children who tried to seek the American dream were brutally treated by authorities sworn to protect the dream. The Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity and finds himself in exile in his own land. In a handful of years, his leadership led to landmark civil rights laws, court decisions that struck down segregated facilities, guaranteed the right to vote. But Dr. King knew it was meaningless if the poor had no jobs, couldn't afford the blessings of liberty. It meant whites sharing with blacks, new jobs, just as the military brass was calling for another $12 billion to wage an already unpopular war. So he demanded jobs for the poor, an end to the war. For those who say to me, stick to civil rights, I have another answer. And that is that I fought too long and too hard now against segregated public accommodation to end up segregating my moral concerns. Now, 20 years later, how close have we come to his dream? Some things would obviously please him. The number of black mayors has risen from six in 1965 to nearly 400 today. The number of black elected officials generally has risen from 600 to over 6,000. And here, a city that seems forever a building. Jobs for the builders, towering new office buildings, homes and schools for all. A municipal center on the site where riots began 20 years ago. But fewer homes at higher cost for the poor, a new plague sweeping the land mind-wrecking drugs, a soaring homicide rate, fear that anywhere could suddenly become unsafe. Some office holders are not leaders, and some leaders are not office holders. We need a leader who can take us to higher heights. Some hear in Jesse Jackson the voice of the murdered dreamer. Others say it is a mere echo yet to be tested. Time will tell, of course, but the test has begun, as this Herb Block cartoon illustrates in today's post. The question, is Jesse Jackson the new dreamer or a loose cannon on deck? Jim Clark, News 7. Dr. King's dream of jobs and progress for blacks is still just a dream for many of DC's poor. A new study shows that many of them still can't find jobs that pay enough to let them escape poverty. Insufficient training, transportation, and child care are the key obstacles. The study concluded that the growing number of working poor contradict the American dream that work assures a decent standard of living. Well, Paul, Jesse Jackson's dream of winning the Democratic presidential nomination is facing a severe test in today's Wisconsin primary. Jackson went into the Democratic pri primary trailing Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis in both delegate count and the polls. Political analysts say that Jackson needs a win in a state with few black voters to prove his electability. Wisconsin election officials are expecting a heavy turnout at the polls today. Sports is next with Jim Berry. He'll have the highlights of the NCAA championship game and what a game it was. And the defending world champion Minnesota Twins open the season against the Yankees. The latest from New York is coming up. Well, this is the kind of weather that says baseball, but I guess there's basketball in the news, too, right? That's right. Kansas uh, surprised a lot of people, maybe even themselves, by how well they played last night. Kansas Jayhawks got a hero's welcome when they returned to Lawrence, Kansas today. And why not? After winning a thriller last night, they sure deserve it. The big man, Danny Manning, got big, big cheers when he stepped up to address the crowd today. Manning thanked the Jayhawk boosters for sticking with the team through the good and the bad, and he held up the trophy, saying that Kansas indeed is number one. Manning could not have written a better script to his story, could he? His final collegiate game going out, a champion. Here is how he did it last night against the Oklahoma Sooners at Kansas City. Manning was just unstoppable inside, scoring any number of ways on alley-oops, inside and outside moves, 31 points, 18 rebounds and a number of key steals. Watch him go all the way here with a spectacular move for a three-point play. He sure improved his bargaining power for the NBA draft, didn't he? The only weakness that I see in his game, he'll have to improve the range on his jump shot, but he can do just about everything else, and his coach agrees. 
I've never looked at any NCAA games that I've been involved in in the Final Four before. But I'm going to look at this one, and I'm sure I'll be entertained. I think that I looked at the referees a couple of times, and they were shaking their heads and grinning like it was an exciting game. To anybody who's ever involved in any type of uh, tournament or competition of any kind, to keep your head up and to work hard, and who knows what can happen. And this is from the guys on the team. They said, to all the people who said it couldn't be done, that we would finish the national champs, number one, how do you like us now? <laughs> how do you like us now? Boy, that song is sure getting to working over. And then <laughs> let's move on to baseball. Dave Winfield's agent has confirmed that the Yankee slugger vetoed a trade that would have sent him to the Houston Astros for Kevin Bass. As you know, Yankee owner George Steinbrenner has been trying to unload Winfield ever since hearing about the unflattering remarks in Winfield's soon-to-be-released book. All that confusion didn't seem to bother Dave and his teammates today in their season opener. Look who's back in the Yankee dugout, old Billy Martin, for another ride on the Steinbrenner merry-go-round. And there's Winfield, starting the season off right against the Twins with an RBI single to left. A few batters later, Mike Pagliarulo unloads on Frank Viola, a monstrous three-run homer to give the Yanks a 4-0 lead. Minnesota's only highlight came in the field. Two on, Santana, sharp grounder to third. There's one out, there's two, and three. A triple play on opening day. Wonder if that's ever happened before. A little consolation for the Twins, who got clobbered 8-0 by the Yanks today. The Bullets resume their playoff drive tonight in the Windy City, where they will try to slow down the Air Jordan Express. That is, of course, Michael Jordan, who dazzled the Detroit Pistons for 59 points on Sunday. You know the most impressive part of that performance? He only had one dunk. That was it right there. Jordan worked for his points otherwise and hit that extra stride. But the Bullets have done as good a job as anybody on slowing him down, especially when they play here. Maybe what they ought to do is tease Michael, try to get him off his game a little bit. Maybe they can tease him and talk about the fact that up top, Michael is getting a little thin. Look, look closely. Michael's hair is thinning out a little bit. Maybe if they tease him about that, they'll get him off his game, but I doubt it. Bullets need a win badly. Right now, they're tied with the 76ers for the final playoff spot in the East. The Caps, meantime, will start their playoff series against the Philadelphia Flyers tomorrow. About 2,000 tickets are left for Game 1 at the Caps Center Wednesday. The Caps say that everybody is healthy and raring to go. I know it's just April. You're just getting over the Redskins Super Bowl victory. No time to rest, though. Time to start thinking about next season. The schedule is out. The Skins open Monday night, September 5th, against the Giants in New York. Beside their division opponents, Skins' schedule doesn't look too bad, really, until November when it really gets rough. They play the Saints, Bears, 49ers, and Browns in that order. That Chicago game, you don't suppose the Bears will be looking forward to that one, do you? <laughs> at sports. So I want to know, Jim, let's take a look. Yeah, Mr. Ray can uh, help old Michael out. Okay. <laughs> well, you could have asked for a better spring day, but Jerry Brown will join us with a cooler forecast coming up. And we'll see what Fairfax County is doing to help improve the quality of daycare in the community coming up next. On a lovely day like today, you can imagine how difficult it is to keep a weatherman inside. Well, Jerry Brown wouldn't stay inside. He's outside. He's at the outside the Kennedy Center now. And, Jerry, uh, this was exactly as you predicted, a beautiful day. Well, Paul, uh, last night at 11, I promised you a perfect day to give you an exact quote. And uh, I think we delivered here. Absolutely gorgeous. 79 degrees, the high out at National today. And we've had just about 100% of all possible sunshine. Just perfect. But... There is a big change coming in the weather. Some much needed moisture. And tomorrow night into early Thursday, mark it on your calendar, we are talking uh, some fairly heavy rains, maybe even some thunderstorms. But let's see how it stands right now. Let's go to our current conditions out at National. I told you that 79 was the high for the day, and we are currently in at 77 degrees, 41 percent the relative humidity, and that nice dry wind blowing from the north at 7 miles an hour. The pressure, 2987, and it is rising. Take a look at some of our computer graphics, and we'll show you what is uh, happening around the area. It's, uh, it's what we have now. First of all, if we can go to our satellite shot, I think I can show you that uh, there are no clouds to speak of here on the east coast. The clouds are out to our west, 
and they uh, will be moving in there. We've got it finally. You can see the clear slot here all through the middle Atlantic states, but a big storm system out to our west. Now, what's happening is high pressure out in the ocean, and high pressure that's giving us this beautiful day is going to be moving out in the ocean. It's going to settle there, take a little uh, sea break. I can't blame it, but it's going to slow up that system that's moving our way so that it system's going to stagnate just a bit tomorrow night into Thursday. A storm will develop down in North Carolina, and that will be dumping quite a lot of moisture over us with the chance of some thunderstorms late tomorrow, certainly tomorrow night into the first half of Thursday. Now, in terms of highs tomorrow, it's not going to be all that bad. It's going to start off as a beautiful day, and temperatures should rise up into the 70s. But then the clouds, those clouds we saw in the satellite shot, are going to drift in from the west, and a chance of an afternoon shower, but certainly by tomorrow night, the certainty of showers and maybe uh, the thunderstorms. You can see our forecast map reflecting those systems moving our way. Behind that system, out in the middle part of the country, much cooler air, dramatically cooler air. Whenever you have a dramatic difference between air masses, you're usually going to pay the price in terms of thunderstorms. By the end of the week, we're talking about forecast highs only in the upper 50s to lower 60s, actually a little below normal. We're, so we're a good 15, 16 degrees above normal today. So let's uh, go to our forecast if we can. We'll put it all in writing for you tonight. Starry skies. Go out and look at those constellations. It's going to be a fairly mild evening with temperatures just dipping down around the half century mark in Washington and just a de degree or two cooler than that out in the suburbs. Tomorrow, a beautiful start, but the clouds move in in the afternoon. There's a chance of some afternoon showers, but that will turn into a certainty uh, by tomorrow evening with the showers and maybe a thunderstorm or two. And then the temperature really, the mercury plummeting for the rest of the work week. But the weekend right now looks pretty good. We should have a lot of sun temperatures in the upper 50s to lower 60s. So just some much needed rain to get through and we're bracing for it. In the meantime, enjoy today. Sunset was 736 tonight. We've still got lots more time to enjoy it. Now okay. back to you, Paul and Kathleen. All right, Jerry, thank you very much. We'll see you back at 11 o'clock. Okay. Well, Paul, the month of April has been designated as the month of the young child and a major focus will be child care. Fairfax County has an innovative program that works to improve the quality of care that is offered in people's homes. And that program is getting a lot of attention these days. You need to have observed a child well enough so that you know where that child is developmentally. What these women are learning how to talk to a toddler to encourage new speech. And this goes on all day long every Tuesday and Wednesday in classes offered by the Fairfax County Office for Children. Vis-a-vis -vis adults, young children are very powerless, <coughs> and there are many times when they feel very helpless. Most of the women enrolled already offer daycare in their homes, or they're considering a career in family daycare. Some of it is common sense, but a lot of it are things that you don't take time to think about during the day when you're with children. They open your eyes up and your ears up to listen to the children, which is really important. Right now, this type of course is not required anywhere in our area to be officially listed or to be licensed as a home daycare provider. But Fairfax County is considering making it mandatory to be on their official list. Yeah, very good. To make it enticing now, the county provides free daycare so providers can bring their whole group along during regular daytime hours. The children play while the adults learn about child's play. Things that you have in your kitchen drawer, you don't need to go out and buy any more items for your family daycare home. You can just use what you already have. Home daycare is by far the most common form of child care, yet it's the least regulated. But there's a strong movement to professionalize it from both parents and providers who want to be taken seriously. Requiring courses like this one is a big step in that direction. I think it will improve the quality of life for young children. I think it will also improve the quality of life for families, that they will feel um, more secure in the situations that they're leaving their children in. By requiring a course like this, there's a good chance of weeding out those people who get into child care for the wrong reasons. And of course, it's because of the bad apples that there's such a big push these days for regulating home day care. Very important to people who are looking, so many people are looking for places That's for right. their children. Thank you, Kathleen. Tonight on the latest at 11 o'clock, we'll have more on the case of Conan Owen, the Annandale photographer sentenced today to a six years in a Spanish prison. And that's it for News 7 at 6. Thanks for joining us. Join us again at News 7 at 11. Good night. Good night.